Welcome to the Vet Me Rehabilitation Podcast, where we aim to help fellow Vet Me rehab therapists increase their knowledge and elevate their practice. I'm Megan Kelly. And I'm Anae Lloyd. Together, we bring you the latest insights, research, and information in the field of veterinary rehabilitation. This podcast is brought to you by Online Pet Health, a leading continued education membership for veterinary rehabilitation therapists. With Online Pet Health, you'll have access to a wide range of online resources to help you stay up to date with the latest techniques, advances, and trends in the industry. Our podcast features in-depth conversations with leading experts in veterinary rehabilitation. They share their own experiences and knowledge to help you improve your practice. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out in the field, our goal is to provide you with the tools and the insights you need to succeed. So join us as we explore the exciting world of vet knee rehabilitation and help you take your practice to the next level. Hey vet rehabbers, if you are looking for some free CPD, we have a few options for you. Now on the 10th and 11th of November, it is our Vet Rehab Summit. It is our annual online vet knee rehabilitation conference and it is our seventh year we are hosting this event. The theme this year is myofascial lines and the lectures are Vitka Elbrond and Rika Schultz. Now, we do offer a free ticket to the summit, so you don't get access to all the lectures, but we do give you access to one of the lectures, and you're also able to network and check out all the exhibitors online. You can go to vetrehabsummit.com for more information. We have three webinars which you can access right now, so immediately. And they are Diagnosis and Non-Surgical Management of Digit Injuries in Dogs, lectured by Jennifer Brown, Gait Assessment for Canine Hydrotherapy Patients by Amy Kings, and How TAC Influences Movement by Lauren Birkbeck for our equine vet rehabbers. If you want to access any of those lectures, you can go to onlinepetalk.com forward slash free. Now, today I speak with Jonathan Lowe from O3 Vets. We discuss ozone therapy and its use in pets. Now, using oxygen to treat a whole lot of different conditions and how it differs from hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Before we have head over to that chat, a quick word from our sponsors. Paul Prosper believes true pet well-being demands a three-pronged approach, prevention, support, and rehabilitation. Their brands are trusted by veterinarians, universities, and rehab facilities alike. So whether you're looking to train, rehabilitate, or help your pet age gracefully, their brands like Help Em Up Harness, Fit Paul's Muffin Taylor and Response System offer effective, innovative, and proven solutions. You can learn more about how Paul Prosper can help pets age gracefully today at paulprosper.com. You can also see them and their brands at this year's Vet Rehab Summit on the 10th and 11th of November. I really enjoyed this conversation about ozone therapy, so over to Jonathan. Hey, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me. Meg, nice to, nice to be here. Thank you for having me. For the listeners, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself and how you got into ozone therapy, please? Okay, yeah. So nothing like crazy exciting. My name is Jonathan Laudo. I'm the founder of O3 Vets, the author of the Essential Guide to Ozone Therapy for Animals. And really, I got into this. I was working on the human side and realized nobody was really promoting ozone therapy for animals, developing equipment, developing protocols, developing all the things necessary to provide animals with these treatments. And, and so this was about 2013. So about 10 years ago now. And, uh, I just slowly began to do that. I met some veterinarians who were more holistically minded. They were doing ozone therapy and, uh, they'd said, Hey, we, he, he, it'd be awesome if you did get into this area, because like I said, I was on the human side a little bit more doing some things, um, similar. And so it really just snowballed from there. It was kind of like this unplanned uh, happening, uh, a sequence of events that led to uh, my wife and I really being where we are now with with O3 Vets, which is really about providing ozone therapy equipment and training to veterinarians, but also to pet guardians. Um, so it's really both those audiences that are the people who are, we are focusing on. So when I think about ozone, the, the first thing I actually think about is COVID-19. And I hate to bring up COVID-19 because it's over now, right? But I, I remember actually reading something about ozone and surface disinfectant for COVID-19 and a potential way to treat COVID-19. Is this I mean, something that ozone was actually used for? Or was it one of those sort of just social media things that, that blew up yeah. and actually wasn't a thing? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of my 
the the veterinarians who helped me get into this, uh, Dr. Margot Roman. She, you know, some people love her, some people hate her. She's one of those people who's just so passionate about what she does. And she used ozone, and she's used ozone therapy for a long time, well before I got into it. Um, but she developed this website, developed this technique, developed these things around COVID-19 to help disinfect in her clinic or uh, personal equipment, masks, other things that you're using on a consistent basis. Um, she she was recommending, and she went to like the CVC. She went to different organizations and 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 in uh, the uh, and senators and uh, to try to get ozone approved uh for use in that iofray to to help us to fight this virus and uh so that that was just kind of a little side thing going on i think ozone therapy you know is very useful for things like covid 19. um in fact in italy they did where it's more prevalent and more widely used they did some trials in the hospitals there on covid 19 patients where they were using they use multiple methods, I believe, but this study that I remember that sticks in my mind is actually one where they use an, a form of ozone therapy where they nebulize basically ozone. So they they bubbled ozone gas through an oil, like an olive oil, and it breaks the ozone down. Basically, it it kind of re, remakes it, I guess you could say, as as peroxides and ozonides, and those are in vapor form inhaled. Um, which is the only safe way, by the way, to inhale ozone. You you can't breathe ozone gas. I mean, you can, we do in small amounts, but large amounts is, is hazardous and, and damaging to the lungs. So that's where it gets its bad rap. But yeah, I think it has pl- a place with COVID-19 for sure um, and other viruses and bacteria as well. What is the, the normal way that you would treat a patient, whether it's a human or an animal? So you say, obviously... You can maybe that through the the olive oil. What are the other other ways that you would be able to treat them? Yeah, well, I, I tell people there's over 14 different ways to administer ozone therapy to animals. Um, so it's it's not one size fits all. It just really depends on the indication and the animal at times. And sometimes it's six one way, half a dozen the other, meaning it doesn't really matter which administration method we use. But then other times there's a lot of rhyme and reason behind why we choose one. Um, so, for example, if we're doing a, sy- a systemic treatment, so the, the patient has a chronic disease of some sort, regard- really regardless of what we're doing, we're going to administer it through either rectal insufflation or something we call major autohemotherapy, which is withdrawing a little bit of blood, putting ozone gas into that blood, and then putting it back in the vein. So one of those two methods or potentially subcutaneous saline with an animal depending on the size of the animal you know on horses we don't do that but um on small animals we will so if there's but for example if there's a joint injury so there's a ruptured cruciate we can use ozone injections locally into that area and typically we recommend ozone injections along with prp platelet-rich plasma or prolotherapy or even stem cells because there's a synergistic effect between those therapies and ozone therapy together. So it just really depends on what we're treating. Ear infections, you know, we'll use ozonated saline or we'll use potentially ozone gas or ozone oil even in those situations. And sometimes we'll use a combination of those things. Yeah, so you basically are getting, uh, so op- the ozone is actually O3, right? And Correct. so you're getting that, which is in a gas format. And then you need to try and somehow, because we can't breathe it in, somehow get into some format to be able to either inject it or we can use the gas on areas. So like say you had a let's say you had a really badly infected wound. You could put a covering over it and then it put the gas into that into that area, right? Abs absolutely, yes. And you bring up a good point. Um, that ozone is O three. We all know oxygen is O two. And and so Ozone is really just a more reactive form of oxygen is what it boils down to. Yeah, being reactive, uh, we can't really store it long. So we generate, when you do ozone therapy, you basically generate the gas right there on site. So you have this ozone generator and it's hooked to an oxygen tank. And with that oxygen, because we want to use pure oxygen to make ozone, we feed the generator with oxygen gas. And as we do that, 
high voltage electricity creates ozone. And, and that's what we use to treat the patient. Sometimes again, we'll use the gas. Sometimes we'll actually bubble it through an oil and nebulize that. And at other times we'll ozonate a fluid. So like saline or distilled water can saturate with ozone. Thing is it's reactive. It breaks down quickly when it comes into contact with organic matter. That could be a bacteria. It could be a cell. It just depends, but yeah, that's a good point. So what are its main uses? That's a tough question. If you go look on Google Scholar or PubMed or any really scientific database for studies, I, and I'd like to try to stay to what we know, with what we know. Um, we can go outside the box and try ozone therapy on a variety of things. And typically it's going to have some sort of positive effect because of how it works. And we can get into that in a second maybe, but it's... Its main uses is tough to nail down because it has, there's a lot of different conditions that have been studied and where it's proven to be effective and helpful. I would say, you know, that if we're going to focus on a particular category, it's fairly broad, but inflammation, inflammatory diseases, um, diseases that have as their root, some sort of inflammation it is really probably where, where it's, that's the bread and butter <laughs> of ozone therapy. And so that might be arthritis, you know, and that might be a local version of arthritis in a particular joint. It might be full body. It could be it's various types of, you know, of chronic diseases from cancer, which has inflammation as part of, uh, you know, the, the root issue going on there to autoimmune conditions where you have an overreaction of immune cells and you have this chronic inf inflammation going on where we're supposed to stop the production of immune cells because our body doesn't need that many. But for some reason or another that a lot of times we don't fully understand, um, the body just keeps producing those. And so ozone can really help to reduce inflammation and in some of those things. So you said that you can also, uh, you also teach um, pet parents how to use it. So what type of formulations would they be giving? I mean, they always yeah. have machinery or anything like that. Yeah, so there is one way to administer ozone that doesn't require equipment or an ozone generator, and that is through ozonated oils. So, for example, our, our company has oils that we have pre-prepared, -pre basically, and it's the only way you can, you can kind of save ozone for future use because the gas breaks down quickly, the fluids break down quickly. In an oil, it has what we call double bonds, and those double bonds trap and hold ozone as an ozonide which is a less reactive form of ozone basically. And, and so that's one way they can do it at home. They can apply it topically, but that's really just for top of, topical indications. To be honest, most of the, uh, the, the pet guardians that we deal with actually do have equipment. So we, we actually sell them an ozone generator um, and they'll, they use that ozone generator at home to generate the ozone they need and most of the time, these people are coming to us from a veterinarian. So the veterinarian says, hey, we think you need to do this at home. You need to do it more frequently, it, you know, and you need to do it. Um, maybe they come from a long distance or something. So it's hard for them to get to the veterinary clinic uh, very often. Uh, so they'll send them to us and they'll purchase what they need to do it at home. And they'll go back and we have training programs in place that we kind of come alongside and help them figure out and understand how to do that. But they're actually making ozone at home and predominantly they're using it through rectal insufflation because that's the easiest systemic way to administer ozone to a pet at home. So is that basically like um, putting gas into the rectum? Exactly, yeah. So basically what it, what it is, is you have a syringe, you put it, you connect it to your ozone generator. Um, it fills with ozone gas. You can't see the difference. You can smell ozone, so you can smell the difference. but can't see any difference from oxygen. And then you connect uh, a little flexible um, rectal catheter and insert that about three inches into the rectum, basically. It depends on the size of the animal a little bit. And, and then infuse the gas. And really that gas is absorbed then into the tissue. And that the downstream effect of ozone, ozone is absorbed. It kind of goes away. You could never see it or measure it in there because it reacts so quickly. But the downstream effect is the production of ozonides and that can be transferred around the body then and have a systemic effect is that has this effect on both oxygen utilization, inflammation, and cell signaling. 
And those are three areas of how ozone works that are crucial. So there's another type of oxygen um, treatment. So hyperbaric oxygen. So we obviously don't want to get these two confused. Won't you tell us the difference between hyperbaric oxygen treatment and ozone treatment? Yeah, well, I'll do my best. I think, so it's funny because there, we had a veterinarian we worked with a while back. He's passed on, unfortunately, but really neat guy. And he would work with horses, um, show horses predominantly in Kentucky. And he he said he likened ozone therapy to an internal hyperbaric treatment. And I thought that was kind of clever way to, to view it. Although it may be a little simplistic, uh, he wasn't trying to say that's all it is. But, you know, it's it's somewhat similar in some ways. So if you know about hyperbaric oxygen therapy, basically what they do is they have this big chamber um, and even sometimes they'll have uh, a size big enough to fit a horse into um, down to, you know, smaller chamber chambers for, for small animals um, or humans. And uh, basically they'll, they'll put the, the animal in there and they'll, they'll infuse oxygen It'll pressurize oxygen um, in that chamber and it, and it forces it into the body of the animal and into their cells, into their plasma ultimately. And that oxygen, that really high oxygen content is basically hyper oxygenating the body. And, and it can really help with, with inflammation. It can help with wound healing and it can help with strokes. It can help with a number of things. And so it's, it's a. It's a way to really hyperoxygenate the body. Well, ozone therapy does that in a sense, but from a cellular level. So it doesn't force all this oxygen into the body. What ozone does is it goes into the cell. And as it reacts with some of the components of that cell, it corrects an imbalance in the cell, which allows the cell then to take in oxygen and utilize it efficiently. So it takes oxygen in then and converts it into ATP, which is cellular energy. So ozone therapy can be hugely beneficial in helping the body utilize oxygen more efficiently, whereas hyperbaric therapy will basically flood the body with oxygen, but it won't necessarily be doing the same thing, correcting an imbalance in the cell, um, which ultimately leads to better oxygen usage. So mm -hmm. you can look at it as, hey, when you breathe, you know, like hyperbaric oxygen would be providing a lot of oxygen to the body. But if that, if the body can't use it very well or efficiently because our cells are damaged and our body isn't functioning properly, it really doesn't matter how much oxygen we have available. Um, it's just going to waste. So that's where ozone can really be beneficial. Yeah, that was a great explanation. So what are the, what are the side effects, if there are any, of treating with ozone? Yeah, I, I think, um, so there's, if you go look at the research that's done on ozone therapy, you actually won't find any consistent side effects listed for ozone therapy. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. One, we still have some work to do to unearth maybe how ozone therapy can have, uh, you know, some side effects that we're not seeing uh, consistently, at least um, in the studies that are being done yet. So that may be one cause, but Two, it's, it's really because to a large degree, um, ozone therapy doesn't have these significant side effects that we've come to expect in some other medical interventions. <laughs> and so I think there's probably more work that needs to be done, but there's nothing consistent um, that I'm aware of. There will be people who, who call us, you know, and say, hey, my animal responded this way or veterinarian even, hey, we're seeing this. Is that normal? And Really, just most of the time, we're like, no, but it's good to know, you know, and uh, we'll try to continue to collate this information and, and come up with some of that stuff. But overall, it's tolerated really well. Sometimes you'll have some lethargy some, uh, at times, and, and I'm not 100% sure why that is. Um, some people attribute it to die off of, you know, s s uh, pathogens and stuff. I don't know if that's true. It's hard to say without doing really some good studies. <laughs> But the really mild side effects when there are, I would say. Except if you breathe it in, right? So right. if you breathe in the gas, then it's yep. but you're yep. a bit damaging. Exactly. Yeah. And and again, that's uh that's obviously one of the ways we don't administer it. So it's really not a side effect, it's a misuse. Um and and so but you do you're right. We have to be really careful about that. 
And, and yet we do all breathe ozone every single day. In fact, I was sitting with my daughter at home the other day, somebody opened the door and, and she works with me. Um, so both know well what ozone smells like. And we're both like, oh, ozone, <laughs> you know, um, because it's just this fresh smell and people don't even think about it, but there's, we, there's ozone all the time. It's just a matter of how much. As um, I've been sitting chatting to you, I can see in the background, you've got one of those blue like humidifiers and I can see oh, that. Yeah. And as you're talking, I'm thinking, I wonder if he's got some ozone. <laughs> like, yeah, I actually can't. I do not. I do not. <laughs> Like secretly treating yourself while you're doing a pond pass do you? <laughs> it's a good idea though. Um, so are there any contraindications? Are there any particular conditions which we don't want to be using ozone for? So historically, what they've said is bleeding conditions you have to be careful of um, because ozone makes the blood flow better. It just improves blood flow properties. And so if blood was thin to begin with, if we don't have many platelets, um, we have a clotting disorder, uh, thrombocytopenia or something like that, then traditionally they've said uh, that we don't want to treat those patients. And I say they, meaning some of the European authorities who have put together some of the uh, guides for ozone therapy in humans. However, they're much more stringent and careful than um, is necessary because they are trying to get ozone therapy approved in a number of these countries and they want to make sure that it seems legitimate. And when you don't have contraindications listed, um, it kind of seems a little hokey. I say that because uh, there actually have been certain, n number one, most of our veterinarians still treat animals that have some sort of bleeding disorder. They'll just maybe do it a little more carefully, maybe a half dose, maybe not draw blood, but do rectal insufflation, stay away from blood, you know, and, and some of them have been hugely helped. And, and that's the thing. There's some bleeding disorders that have been, you know, that will really benefit. I would mention that as the, the caveat, the, the one area where we know maybe we need to be a little more judicious. Do you have any case studies or stories from veterinarians that have been using ozone? Some like of those sort of wow. Yeah, uh, man, there's been so many and I wish I could call like five or six to mind. I, I'm sure I could if we sat here. One that does come to mind um, is by a doctor named Dan Ahrens in Texas. And they had a patient, I remember, at the beginning of their use of ozone therapy, which was a number of years now, that came in with cardiac cancer. And this had been something that had been um, verified. You know, it wasn't, uh, so the tests were done. They had it done at a Texas A&M, which is a university there, you know, and it came to them. And this is a case where you would expect, you know, they don't have long to live at all. And uh, so they did, so we work with primarily ozone therapy, but we also work with something called ultraviolet light radiation. So they did a combo treatment anyway. I just want to mention that to say, they combined ozone therapy with UBI and they did this treatment every day for a week on this dog um, who came in with cardiac cancer that had metastasized to the lungs and it was just looking really bad. And two weeks later, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, I believe it was two weeks, it wasn't long later, they went and they had this same dog uh, ultrasounded at Texas A&M and they couldn't find any cancer. <laughs> Um, it was, it was just incredible. And we, we get stories fair, quite frequently. I was just on the phone the other day with just a, a, a pet guardian, um, who uses our, it's called pet liniment 10%. And she was like, I swear by this stuff. She, it, it's just a topical cream. She's like, anytime my dog gets hot spots, it's the only thing that will get rid of them. She, and she's like, we just, it's the, it's the only ointment we have now in our, in our first aid kit. <laughs> and and um, so my family's similar. We use it all the time. Uh, so there's there's from everything from hot spots to cardiac cancer, um, and there's so many stories in between that I could tell you. But those those are a few just quick ones that come to mind right now. Yeah, those are great stories. I love stories like that. And you just yeah, everyone's just dumbfounded. They're like, we can't explain this, but it yeah. happens. So I mean, just listening to that story just makes me think like you know, shouldn't we be using ozone then as maintenance for just for general health, right? 
Yeah. Um, but we all know that we have everyone, animals, ourselves have cancer cells within us. It's just something happens to get them to start mutating. Wouldn't us treating ourselves and treating animals on a regular basis, like a maintenance treatment with ozone, be helping to restore that cellular health, cellular health and maybe yeah. prevent cancer? Is there any research on that? Yeah. In fact, um, so I, I, I mentioned at the beginning, I recently wrote a book um, called The Essential Guide to Ozone Therapy for Animals. And in the, in the book, I mention or talk about a little bit the idea of prophylactic use or preventative use of ozone therapy. It's not like the the main usage because primarily we go to the doctor when we're sick, right? So that's where it's used predominantly. But absolutely, as far as uh, there's two areas. One is just that that uh, preventative use of ozone therapy, and the other is in performance animals. So you have both are similar um, in that they are working on a healthy body to help maintain health or to improve health or performance um, when when we need that. And I think uh, that, yes, using ozone therapy on a consistent basis, not so when we're doing dealing with chronic illness, we'll do it more frequently. We don't need to do that. You know, if you're healthy, you know, once every other week or once a month is, is sufficient. So we don't have to overdo it, but yeah, it's definitely an area that has, we call it preconditioning. Actually, in some of the studies you look at, there's preconditioning um, of the cells and basically, it's an adaptive response. Your body is responding to a stimulant. It's responding to this oxidative molecule. And that oxidative molecule, which would by some be classified as a, as what we call a free radical, which can do harm in the body if they're unchecked, um, actually stimulates the production of antioxidants. It stimulates the utilization of oxygen. And so there's some really good downstream effects of ozone therapy, even on healthy cells. Mm. I can really see it being used in the equine performance. You know, I mean, do you have any vets that are using it to increase performance in competitive horses, race horses? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not enough. And in fact, that particular area, we haven't even hardly scratched the surface at this point. But man, I, I, I see that exploding. Um, in the not too distant future as a usage that can really have some potentially great results you know, for performance and racehorses, um, show horses even. Yeah, I, I, I remember one a person where we work with who said, man, when I do ozone therapy, the, the, the shiny coat is just amazing, you know, afterwards. I don't know what exactly to attribute that to, um, but, uh, you know, from from the show horses to increasing basically circulation and increasing the cap oxygen capacity, blood carrying capacity of the cells um, can be huge. And then do you, for the horses, are they, are they doing that subcutaneously? So they're infiltrating the ozone into like a ringer's lactate solution or something you know, in a drip bag, and then they just run it subcutaneously. Is that how they are being treated? It depends on the person um, who's administering it. So there's a variety of ways. That's an easy way to do it. You know, not probably intravenous more. So intravenous ozonated saline can be used. Rectal insufflation, again, is an easy way, even on large animals, to do it. Some veterinarians um, feel really comfortable and are really skilled at doing what's called DIV, which is direct intravenous ozone infusions, uh, where they slowly infuse ozone gas right into the jugular. And it sounds a little crazy, but there's veterinarians who are doing that with excellent results. And, and when they do it properly, it's a very safe technique, but it just depends on the animal. Some of it's topically as well. Um, so to just in, uh, encourage recovery. Wow, so this has been really interesting chatting with you. And yeah, uh, thanks for sharing your knowledge. For those people that are wanting to find out more about ozone therapy, where would they be able to get hold of your book? Um, yeah, on, on Amazon. Now, it just depends on, that's one way to get it, uh, amazon.com. And again, it's called The Essential Guide to Ozone Therapy for Animals. And then on our website, o3vets.com, um, they can also find it there. Uh, so we can ship all over the world from, from there. We're hoping to, you know, right now, actually, we're working on I'm um, almost done with the translation into Portuguese because there's a lot of veterinarians in Brazil who do ozone therapy and, and they wanted, they contacted me and said, Hey, we need to get this translated into Portuguese. 
So can you do that? And so right now we're, we're working on that. It's almost finished. Um, and so there's options, you know, that we're looking to hopefully get the word out there into other languages and other countries as well. But yeah, there's two places to get it right now. And then are you supplying ozone equipment um, just to the United States or internationally? We, we sell internationally. We sell all around the world. Uh, and uh, so there, there is that potential. If there are options for people to get it in their country, which sometimes there are and sometimes they're not, I would always encourage them to probably do that because it's just easier to to work with somebody locally than to you know uh, to have to work with a company overseas. So we can maybe even put people in touch with with a local company that might be able to help them, and we can provide some training or some resources because there's there's not really any companies out there doing this for animals. Um, there's there's a couple throughout the world. So most likely the country that you live in um, doesn't have something, or if they do, it's very underdeveloped for animals. It's very kind of you. Yeah, thank you for the offer. So um, the, for the listeners, if you're interested in that book, I will put the link in the podcast description now. Jonathan, thank you for your time. It's been great chatting. Well, my pleasure. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll get the chance to chat again sometime in the future. Great. Have a good day. All All right. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. A big thanks to our sponsor, Paul Prosper. Their sponsorship allows us to be able to give this podcast to you for free. Please go and check them out. You can go to paulprosper.com. Don't forget to bookmark the next Vet Rehab Summit. It's on Friday the 10th and Saturday the 11th of November. Come and be a part of the world's largest online veterinary rehabilitation conference. It's created specifically for you, the Vet Rehabber community. Online Pet Health members, you get VIP complimentary access to the Vet Rehab Summit. For more information and continued education for vet rehabbers, you can go to onlinepethealth.com.